Thank you and welcome. I want to say a few words about why we're here today and what we're hoping to accomplish through this day. As a university, um, we organize any number of events. We have talks and symposia and, and special teach-ins and all sorts of events that help us address specific topics. And as we've been organizing these events, we find that the topics proliferate. Um, and they've been especially proliferating rapidly recently. And so we wanted to take a moment and a day to step back and think more systematically and more comprehensively about these forces that are producing the turmoil and producing the outcomes that we are experiencing. The reasoning for this is that without this kind of uh, context, without some sort of systematic way of organizing these events, it's easy to become overwhelmed and then it's easy to turn off. We have controversies magnified and amplified by a 24-hour news cycle. We have pundits constantly vying for our attention, clickbait around every corner, constant rancor in the halls of government, and the issues seem to proliferate. The issues that divide us seem to proliferate. Immigration, health care, gun violence, Me Too, anthem protests, border walls, travel bans, and so on and so on and so on. These are challenging times and it's easy to become overwhelmed and then it's easy to turn off. The university setting provides both unique challenges and unique opportunities. The challenges are obvious. We see them around us all the time. This is a place where we come and for many of us, this may be the most diverse place we've been. Our views are challenged. Our most fundamentally held beliefs can be challenged and they can be challenged in very aggressive and sometimes painful ways. But the university also holds unique opportunities for us to come together as educators and as students, as co-workers and colleagues, and support each other and learn from each other and help each other understand these forces that are driving us apart. So while the goal for the day is not to focus on any one topic, of course the various sessions we have planned will, will take these up. But our goal is broader than that, is to help each other understand what the forces are that are driving us apart, because issues themselves are not polarizing. Issues are not inherently polarizing, it's what's happening around them, it's the broader context that produces this. And so the day is organized around a variety of sessions, a mix of sessions. We start with history, because we always like to start with history and my students will tell you that we always start with history. And the goal for that is to really put things into a broader context, understand what is new and what isn't new, what is normal and what isn't normal, what is normal and shouldn't be normal. And history helps us put that into broader perspective. And we have a distinguished panel of speakers who will help us reflect on the history of ongoing exclusion and discrimination and challenges for racial, ethnic, religious minorities in the US. We have a featured guest, Leisha Brooks, who will be speaking to us d during our midday keynote, helping us understand the issues that are driving this in the US today. Our midday session, our midday panel discussion, is a view from the social sciences that, that will help us understand the structures of polarization, as I, as I like to call it. These are structural forces that act often invisibly to drive these outcomes. They act slowly, but they act powerfully. And this panel of, of speakers will help us understand this from various perspectives. After that, our breakout sessions are meant to be smaller, opportunities for engagement and we have a great array of breakout sessions that will help build skills to overcome polarization through interpersonal dialogue, group dialogue and beyond. We also will have a documentary, a watch, learn, grow documentary running concurrently uh, titled Abrazos. The final two sessions for the day, we have two featured guests. The first, Jelani Cobb, will help us uh, understand one of the more challenging issues that affects all of these controversies, and that's the issue of speech. Also one of the bedrock issues that, that animates our democracy and our democratic engagement. The final session, I said we begin with history, we will also end with a historical and comparative perspective, reflections from Daniel Ziblatt on how democracies die, how they have died in the past, and how we can 
uh, guard against these polarizing tendencies that drive people apart. So our goal for the day and our hope is to replace the overwhelming noise of the punditry with the empowering force of analysis, dialogue, and understanding. Thank you and welcome. So this, this morning's panel is called Hate in Historical Perspective. Um, and we will have these three wonderful um, panelists. They will each speak for about um, no longer than 20 minutes. And I've told them I will nudge them if they go over. Um, and then um, we will have a time for questions and answers and concerns and frustrations and um, epiphanies and, and all of the, the thoughts that are going through your mind as you hear these, these speakers. Um, we're at a time now in this, in this country, um, in this state, and on this campus where we really have to um, push ahead to try and understand what is going on, where this um, hate is coming from and how we can, um, in our own way, avert it. So our first speaker this morning is Evelyn Simeon. She's professor of political science and director of the Race, Ethnicity, and Politics Graduate Certificate Program at the University of Connecticut. She is professor of political science, and her first book, Black Feminist Voices in Politics, um, was published in 2006. It examines black feminist consciousness and its effect on political behavior using national survey data. Her second book, Gender and Lynching, The Politics of Memory, was published in 2011. It focused on African-American women who suffered racial sexual violence at the hands of lynch mobs in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Her third book, Historic Firsts, How Symbolic Empowerment Changes U.S. Politics, was published in 2015. It considers whether candidates like Shirley Chisholm in 1972 and Jesse Jackson in 1984, as well as Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Barack Obama mobilized voters through emotional appeals while combating stereotypes and providing more inclusive representation. And I'm sure she's already thinking towards 2020 and these candidates that are popping up. Um, a nationally recognized teacher, P Professor Simeon, was awarded the 2006 Anna Julia Cooper Teacher of the Year Award from the National Conference of Black Political Scientists and the 2007 Teaching Promise Award from the American Association of, of University Professors. She was also recognized as the 2017 Faculty Member of the Year by the University of Connecticut Chapter of the NAACP. She teaches both undergraduate and graduate classes for example, African American politics, black feminist theory and politics, black leadership and civil rights, as well as race, gender, and ethnic politics. Uh, let's welcome Professor Simeon. Good morning. I'm gonna say that again, good morning. Part of that is for myself because honestly, I'm still tired. I'm still half asleep. I'm one of those faculty that never teach in the morning. I like to sleep in. I'm a bit of a night owl. Um, matter of fact, I was probably up till 2 a.m. last night. So um, I'm still trying to wake up. But bear with me. I come with a lot of energy, enthusiasm, and honestly, I love what we do as academics. In some ways, I feel like it's been a calling to sort of have the privilege, the opportunity to think about, to um, analyze our day to day in a very political sense, in a timely moment. And so in preparation for this morning's talk, and the title of my talk is, The More Things Change, The More They Remain the Same, Racial, Sexual Violence, Hate Speech, and Collective Memory. I wanted to make this talk timely, to make it relevant, to make it count. I'm not sure how many of you have been following the news, particularly over the course of the weekend, but it forced me to sort of reflect upon 
really the purpose of this morning's panel session. That is to connect the past with the present, something I so often do in my classes as well as my written work. I've always been interested in the ways in which the past often manifests itself time and time again in the here and the now. So honestly, I'm going to talk about the governor of Virginia. And I'm going to talk about black minstrelsy and black face in, in a conscious effort to connect the dots, to talk about how his apology, as many of you probably already feel, is insufficient and lacking in some significant ways. And then his recant the following day just as problematic and faulty. So for those of you that may not have been following MSNBC, Fox News, or CNN, I will provide some background, some details. So this morning, I want to kick it off with a story that has gripped the headlines this past week, and specifically an apology and subsequent news conference regarding the Virginia governor, Northam, that has captured the attention of several news pundits and leaders, both of the Democratic Party, presidential hopefuls, as well as the head of the National Urban League and the NAACP, all of whom have weighed in and questioned his sincerity as well as his credibility. So I want to connect the past with the present and attempt to offer on my part some semblance of an analysis that might inform the here and now as it relates to the minstrel performance of the past that is performing in blackface. Let me provide you with some of the headlines and the background for this story, keeping in mind all the while the title of my talk is, The More Things Change, The More They Remain the Same. And the headlines read, Virginia Governor Northam weighs resignation. Ignorance shines through Virginia Governor Northam's blackface apology. After racist photo pressure mounts on Virginia, Virginia Governor Northam, Governor Northam refuses to step down despite flood of calls for his resignation over racist photo. Virginia Governor Northam now says it's not him in racist photos and refuses to step down. Here's a backstory. Published by a conservative website on Friday, the racist photo of Northam shows a man draped in a KKK robe standing next to a man in blackface. This photo is featured on the 1984 medical yearbook page of Go Governor Northam. At the time, Northam is between the ages of 24 and 25. Under the picture in his name are listed two nicknames in a caption that reads Goose, comma, Goose Man, Coon Man, in quotes. Northam initially apologized for having appeared in the photo and plainly stated on Friday, and I quote, I am deeply sorry for the decision I made to appear as I did in this photo and for the hurt the decision caused then and now. Note, he said the decision I made to appear as I did at the same time unwilling to admit whether he was the Klansman or the black minstrel. But then Northam held a subsequent press conference on Saturday, 24 hours later, and stated that it was not he in the photo, while at the same time admitting to have put on blackface in the 1980s to portray none other than Michael Jackson in a dance competition for which he had, in fact, won in San Antonio, Texas. This bizarre turn of events from the apology to the press conference has since been characterized as what? A train wreck. Something that has gone awfully bad. 
Several news pundits doubted his credibility and Democratic leaders, many of whom are candidates for the U.S. presidency, have called for his resignation as the Democratic governor of the state of Virginia. So where do I begin? Where do I start? Refer to the real Negro show, minstrel shows emerge in the 1800s. Countless Americans enjoyed watching white men like Northam wearing burnt cork to blacken their face, but in the case of Governor Northam's case, by his own admission, black shoe polish to portray African Americans singing and dancing. That being in his case, back in San Antonio in the 1980s, none other than Michael Jackson. On stage, showcasing their talent. Audiences shrieked in laughter as they witnessed an exaggerated performance of blackness. Actors on stage dressed in outlandish costumes, wearing makeup, speaking unintelligently, and dragging their feet. The buffoon Zip Coon was the ultimate minstrel, and the show was glorified, celebrated entertainment. While today we find these images and performance, performances racially offensive and horrific, they were the most popular form of entertainment in antebellum America. Minstrel caricatures of slaves served to reinforce an image or stereotype of blackness in the minds of white audiences. In the case of Governor Northam, he admits to portraying Michael Jackson singing and dancing, performing his infamous moonwalk and being dressed in costume wearing makeup, that being, in this case, black shoe polish, and possessing Michael's signature glove. Depending on your age, you might recall Michael Jackson's attire and its look being a bit over the top, even androgynous. But it caught our attention, sustained our attention. Perhaps one of his most memorable performances was at the 1984 Grammy Awards show and the signature glove, his shirt, and socks were all what we would call today bedazzled. His dark black eyeliner, red rosy cheeks, and high-pitched falsetto voice challenged the gender binary, and his moves were unconventional, to say the least. How many times did we witness Michael grab his crotch on stage and in countless music videos? That was a gesture that then got adopted by several hip hop or rap artists today. We, the audience, shrieked in laughter or perhaps screamed in response to Michael's performance on stage. Many of us went, were home that night in our kitchen, in our living room, in our bedroom, trying to imitate the moonwalk. It, too, was glorified entertainment. The hype, the circumstance, was duplicated, imitated at talent shows across this country and beyond, likely beyond the US. Now, Governor Northam admits it too was a performance like blackface. But the featured caricature was none other than Michael Jackson. Like the photographic image in the 1984 medical yearbook, it was wrong, he says. But why? Does this man truly understand the answer to that why question? The mystery performance is an exaggerated theatrical performance of a black character type through the use of black face and black mannerisms or gestures and did not go mainstream until the production of Jump Jim Crow by Thomas D. Rice, where the slave would sort of will about, jump about, and jump Jim Crow, crossing his feet on stage. 
The unique dance, like the moonwalk, reinforced an image of blackness, a stereotype in the minds of white audience. So for example, to this day, white audiences believe that what? All black people can dance? And that we've all got rhythm. Rather than resign, Governor Northam intends to serve out the remainder of his term. Here's how I interpret this decision. Northam's decision, like the minstrel show, asserts racial hierarchy. It's a powerful reminder of white privilege that in the face of embarrassment, he can still assert his right, his authority, his privilege to retain that office despite the calls from his, for resignation by members of the Democratic Party, for which he represents, from the head of the NAACP, and from members of Virginia's Legislative Black Caucus. Arguably, the minstrel show is part of our historical collective memories. It shapes our concerns for the present. It makes it possible for groups like the one that gather in Richmond, Virginia, to engage in collective action and demand Governor Northam's resignation. Both images, whether it be the black man excuse me, whether it be the man in black face or the other one standing beside him in the KKK robe in the yearbook photo, both are racially offensive, as were Governor Northam's efforts to portray Michael Jackson in black face for a local talent show. These images, they haunt us. The man in black face and the Klansmen next to him demand our recognition for what they have come to represent, white supremacy. Hierarchy, racial stereotypes, as does Northam's press conference. The minstrel show is a comedic performance that reinforced all these things. It is the minstrel show, the traveling tour of minstrel performers that led to the film Birth of a Nation, originally called The Klansman. The film was a huge commercial success, though it was highly controversial for its portrayal of black men played by white actors in blackface. As unintelligent and sexually aggressive towards white women, and the portrayal of the KKK as a heroic force fighting in defense of white womanhood. The fact that Governor Northam cannot draw this connection is at best troubling. That is, his impersonation of Michael Jackson in blackface is just as, if not equally as, offensive. It is simply a more contemporary version of the same type of minstrel show, albeit dated and not captured in a medical yearbook photo. And so we ask ourselves, what form does the minstrel show take in the 20th century, post-emancipation, even today? If not the slave, then who? What person of color do we mock for whom we can imitate and duplicate their performance for profit before the white gaze and white audiences. Michael Jackson was no doubt a musical genius for whom we revere and respect. Many of us still have his albums. But he was also considered a freak, a young man deprived of his childhood, for we all expected he and his brothers like Zip Coon to sing, dance, and perform for us on stage. He too was laughed at, ridiculed in ways offensive by the tabloids, accused of being deviant, more specifically a pedophile. And so this too is part of Michael's legacy that we have not forgotten. And yes, Governor Northam apologizes just to recant a day later. His refusal to step down and resign from his post is a true testimony 
Another example of his lack of sincerity, remorse for his actions, his inability to act in what some may consider a noble manner for which we might actually respect the man for. To go beyond mere words, but to act in such a way to forfeit such privilege as to maintain this office. To make a conscious effort, to make amends, to repair the damage, and to send an honest, more authentic, or should I say credible message that translates to sacrifice. It's having the ability to forfeit such privilege, white privilege, and humble himself in the only way that might in fact command respect and do what legacy he has, some semblance of justice. And so I will stop there and pass the mic. We're going to have next Professor Franklin Odo, who is Professor of American Institutions and International Dem Diplomacy at Amherst College. Um, Franklin Odo is currently the John J. McCloy Visiting P Professor of American Institutions and International Diplomacy at Amherst College. He teaches Asian American Studies in the American Studies Department. He was founding director in 1997 of the Asian, Amer the Asian Pacific American Center at the, at the Smithsonian Institution, retiring in 2010. He was chief of the Asian Division at the Library of Congress in 2011. Odo was among the first faculty teaching Asian American studies in the early 1970s at UCLA and Cal State Long Beach. He continued at the University of Hawaii Manoa and was a visiting professor at, um, at UPenn Princeton, Princeton College Park, um, Hunter College, and Columbia in the 1990s. His last major monograph was Voices from the Cane Fields, Folk Songs from Japanese Immigrant Workers in Hawaii, published by Oxford in 2013. I should mention, I'm an ethnomusicologist, so this whole panel is just yummy to me. Um, uh, Odo recently edited uh, Finding a Path Forward, Asian American Pacific Island, Islander National Historic Landmarks, um, which was a theme study. Um, he published it, it in hard copy and launched online by the National Park Service in 2017. So please, let's welcome Professor Odo. Um, maybe the audience knows this already, but UMass Amherst boasts um, the, the, the most uh, prolific, uh, prodigious Asian American studies group uh, in the valley and perhaps beyond. And, and so it's a, it's, it's a privilege to be speaking here um, <clears throat> in, 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 in this particular place. I wanted to ask first, um, how many of you have some inkling beyond a smattering of Asian American, of the Asian American experience? So look, look around. So there are not, not that many, but there are a few. How many of you are following the Harvard case, the anti-affirmative action? Uh, a few more. I'm going to end with that. <clears throat> this is a, um, but I wanted to get a sense of how, how much people know about this. Because we, when we started the, the Asian American studies in 1968, 69, 70, I was a young faculty member at Occidental College in Los Angeles. And my training had been in uh, traditional Asian studies. I, I thought I was going to be a China scholar or a Japan scholar, and in fact did a dissertation on, on Japanese feudalism in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. But I got hijacked by um, the movements of the era, anti-war, um, black power, um, la raza, uh, red power, and at the time, Asian Americans were less than 1% of the population, um, just about a million people, maybe a little bit more. Today, we are 7 to 8% of the population, perhaps 
20 million people, and um, maybe not in Western Massachusetts, but a force in uh, a number of different areas, including uh, major metropolitan areas, and, and in fact, um, a force to be reckoned with in, in uh, national elections. So it's interesting, um, having, having started when um, the, the appeal was primarily uh, intellectual and political, but not, but not so much um, in terms of being able to make a difference, just because we were such a small uh, force and not very prominent on the national scene. Uh, this has changed somewhat, but I wanna uh, do the history a little bit and because this is what we're about, I think. Um, people forget, I think, just because we were such a small number uh, until the post-1965 immigration reforms, people forget that, that there were um, people from Asia here in North America. Um, certainly, we think about the uh, Bering Sea and the people crossing the uh, border from um, Siberia to Alaska uh, way, um, way back. But during the Manila, Manila Galleon trade, beginning in the 16th century, you remember that in the Spanish Empire, there were annual voyages from Mexico, from Tijuana to, to Manila. And of course, then there was traffic between um, the, the Philippines, including Chinese and Filipino um, men, primarily men, uh, coming to North America. So that you had Chinese barbers in Mexico City beginning in the 16th and 17th centuries, and you had Filipino shrimpers near New Orleans beginning perhaps as early as the 18th century, but certainly in the early 1800s. And perhaps you know that there were uh, certainly Chinese and Filipino uh, um, veterans of the Civil War uh, fighting on, on both sides. Anyway, you, 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 you get the sense of this. Um, Stephanie mentioned I was at the Smithsonian for a while. One of the things we did was to create exhibitions based on um, particular ethnicities. Because the whole issue of pan, uh, pan ethnic uh, uh, Asian Americans as a, as, a, as a unitary racial group grouping um, has has been um, difficult um, to effect. And <clears throat> so one of the things we did was to create exhibitions on particular ethnic nationality groups. And the first time we did one on Asian Indians. Uh, we discovered that there were, in the colony of Maryland, um, Asian Indians who were there in at least as early as the 1680s. And, and some of these um, men uh, were intermarried with Africans, uh, African descendants or African Americans at, at the time. But I think most of us sort of think of um, Asian immigrants or Asian migrant and workers beginning with the, um, the gold rush in California in eight, beginning in 1849 and then the um, Chinese railroad workers. And some of you are probably aware of the iconic photograph of the promontory, the summit in Utah linking the transcontinental railroads. Uh, that photograph you, you will perhaps know um, deliberately erased the Chinese from, from that commemorative uh, photograph. Um, so, so we have a long history of uh, being, being ignored and, and marginalized, even though, for, for example, there were Chinese bachelors in New York City beginning in the 18th century, um, often marrying Irish maidens who you will remember at the time were about as denigrated as African Americans or, or the Chinese at, at, at the time. So some things change. Some things obviously remain the same. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about how some things change looking at the perspective um, from um, Asian Americans. So 
The racist hate, then, is not that difficult to envision. Um, so by the time the, the Chinese bachelors begin congregating in, in towns and cities in the 1860s and 1870s, you get a, a, an organized backlash from uh, journalists, from workers who feel that their jobs are being taken away by Chinese workers, um, so that by 1875 there is congressional legislation limiting the number of uh, Chinese immigrants on a ship to 15, so that we don't get inundated by uh, too many Chinese folks. And by 1882, um, there is congressional legislation for the first time in American history, limiting or, or prohibiting Chinese uh, workers from a particular nationality or racial group. And that, that of course, is the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, eventually, uh, and that, and because, because we need to be able to justify um, acts like these in terms of rational considerations, um, the, the stories of uh, Chinese neighborhoods um, peopled by, largely by, by bachelors um, who ate rats, um, lived in vile um, neighborhoods over in overcrowded slums, uh, debauched white women, and took white uh, worker uh, jobs uh, was easily understandable and transmittable. And so uh, the 1882 Act, which was for 10 years, was um, um, reapproved in 1892, 1902, and made permanent in 1904, and lasted basically until uh, 1965. So a very, very long time. Um, in fact, in 1904, when the Congress made the act permanent, there was one senator out of, I've forgotten now how many, 18, in 1904, how many states were there? Close to 80 senators, perhaps. There was only one senator who voted nay. His name was George Frisbee Hoare, and he came from Massachusetts. Um, and he acted on principle, and that, that's one of the um, nice things about being in this state. Anyway. <laughs> His statue now um, is in the Capitol building, by the way. But that Exclusion Act uh, directed at the Chinese was soon extended to the Japanese, who had uh, begun arriving in the 1880s. Um, people, the Hawaii sugar plantations uh, as workers and uh, became migrant workers up and down the West, West Coast as well. Uh, by 1917, that uh, general antipathy uh, towards people from that part of the world had extended to what we, what the Congress called the Asia Pacific Triangle, and by 1924 there was a hierarchy in the National Origins Act, which indicated that the as far as, I, I th and I think pre President Trump uh, um, mentioned something to to this effect, that that uh, desirable immigrants came from places like. Great Britain and uh, Northwestern Europe, um, to a certain extent, less desirable folks from Eastern or Southern Europe, and, and certainly Jews. But the people who were not desirable at all were people from the Asia uh, Pacific Triangle. Some of that racist hate was beginning to thaw during World War II, when the um, uh, Pacific War made some of those Asian countries allies as a matter of, as a matter of course. Um, so in 1943, the Congress passed an amendment to the Exclusion Act, which permitted a really token number of Chinese to enter, because China was then a major ally of the United States in the war against, against the Japanese Empire. So the United States had uh, admitted a quota of 105 that, that's right, 105 Ch people of Chinese descent uh, into the United States and allowed people who were here, um, who were of Chinese descent, to become naturalized citizens because they were not allowed to do that um, prior to, to that uh, period. Um, and, and, and Korea and Southeast Asia, of course, were allies as, as well. So some of that 
racist hate began to, to dissolve. Now that didn't extend, of course, to people who were uh, of Japanese descent. Uh, and as you probably know, about 120,000 people, the one drop rule, by the way, um, anybody who was any part Japanese was removed from uh, his or her home on the West Coast and, and, and to, in, into a, a set, what they call assembly centers, detention centers, and then into American style uh, concentration camps uh, during World War II. And the, and the government rationale for that was that uh, in the event of a potential Japanese invasion, uh, there was no rational way, these people were so inscrutable that there was no rational way to, to separate the sheep from the goats. That we could not tell who might be um, potentially uh, uh, saboteurs or, or agents of, of the Empire of Japan. So we had to lock them all up. And, um, and of course in the 80s, Ronald Reagan apologized on behalf of the nation, and, and for, in the only occasion um, in American history, the government provided reparations uh, to the surviving um, 80,000 or so Japanese Americans who had been in, incarcerated. So the, the war proved to be a turning point of sorts. And um, soon, because, and because Japan had been pacified and occupied in the 40s and 50s, it, it became a crucial supply uh, and R&R and &R, uh, situation for GIs in the Korean War, 1950 to 53. And you may remember, um, the Korean War provided the opportunity for the first large-scale organized transnational adoptions to take place of, of Korean orphans who were brought into the United States uh, to, be, to be adopted. Um, and, and of course, in the, in the 60s, uh, Japan became a, a similar uh, spot for the wars that we were conducting in Southeast Asia. That, I, I, should, I should mention, um, because we had GIs in places like Korea, uh, Japan, um, Southeast Asia, and, and particularly the Philippines, the, the, need, the uh, perceived need to provide R&R, uh, &R, recreation, and female bodies uh, became really an, an, a, a way for um, the model minority myth to begin to, to take hold. So, not coincidentally, in 1966, there are a couple of articles that tout Asian Americans as a model minority group, as success stories, as they were, they were uh, labeled, um, which congratulate uh, Asian uh, American minority groups for grit, um, family uh, unity, commitment to education, and deferred gratification, uh, qualities which were um, being seen as deficient in black and brown minorities who were uh, acting out in ways that the society uh, deemed uh, um, unnecessary and unreliable. So anyway, we've, we're living with some of that now, and, and I wanna end by just uh, letting you know that, uh, that the Harvard case, th there's a new wrinkle um, because the plaintiffs are Chinese immigrant parents who, felt, who feel that Harvard's admissions policies are discriminating against uh, Asian Americans. The bulk of the uh, Asian American national leadership, however, stands united in supporting affirmative action. Um, and it, so this is a really interesting uh, phenomenon that is uh, taking place. And uh, I, w I just wanted to say that uh, kinds of model minority, what, what uh, theatrically I've termed racist love, um, the, the affirmation of people who belong here because they know how to behave in ways that are suitable 
uh, and acceptable to uh, a white supremacist uh, point of view is not a acceptable. And um, that's something that I think we need to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Odo. Um, our final um, talk is by P Professor Susanna Heschel. Um, I just want to, to make mention of how brilliant Amel has been in putting this panel together. We are hearing very nuanced understandings of the kind of hate that is surrounding us, not just in terms of the usual binaries, but the real complexities that um, are reflected in American history that are upon us right now. So um, kudos to you, sis. Good, good job. OK, um, so uh, Professor Susanna Heschel is um, the Eli Black professor and chair of the Jewish Studies program at Dartmouth College. She is the author of Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, and the Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany, as well as edited volumes, including Insider Outsider, American Jews and Multiculturalism, and Betrayal, German Churches and the Holocaust. She has been a visiting professor at the universities of Cape Town, Frankfurt, um, Edinburgh, and Princeton, and has held research grants from the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the National Humanities Center, as well as the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. She is a Guggenheim Fellow and is studying the history of European Jewish scholarship on Islam. Her first book on this topic has just been published. She has just co-edited a book with Umar Riyad called The Muslim Reception of European Orienta Orientalism. Please welcome Professor Heschel. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that this panel has been organized and I'm privileged to participate. I'm going to be talking about anti-Semitism and I'm interested in the ways in which attitudes, negative attitudes toward Jews also, t also include negative attitudes toward people of colors, toward uh, women and toward Muslims and I wanna show some of the ways the two influence each other. So let me begin. What are we talking about when we speak about anti-Semitism? There's such a large range of ideas and statements, images, as well as actions. Here are some of them. And you'll see how contradictory they can be. Jews are called usurers, money lenders, enemies of white people, controlling the banks, government, Congress, pushing for war, shirking the military, lazy, secretive, too smart, cunning, rapists, seductresses, asexual, and a third gender. Jews are sitting on a pig, suckling from a pig. Jews are dogs. Jews are portrayed as blindfolded. Jews have huge noses, oily hair. They have fat, smelly, overdressed in fancy clothes and furs. Jews are portrayed looking snarky, slimy, plotting. Jews are called Christ killers, stubborn, legalistic, carnal. The prayers are noise. They are blind to Christian truth after all. How come they didn't realize that Jesus was their own savior? For the Nazis, some Nazis, Jews were, in fact, bacteria, rats, disease. There were some anti-Nazis who said that pro-Nazis were themselves Jews for being Nazis. Jews were beaten on the streets, shops destroyed, women raped, rounded up, tortured, burned alive, expelled from European countries shot into ravines, sent to gas chambers. So where do we begin to sort all this out? Brian Chayette points out that there is no fixed image associated with the word Jew. The image is malleable. It's even used to attack non-Jews. So for example, in Protestant England, Catholics are called Jews. In Catholic France, Protestants are called Jews. In the Middle Ages, Christians called Islam a revival of Judaism. And they didn't mean it positively. Jews are called modern, and Jews are called anti-modern. But the real issue concerns the political uses of anti-Semitism. 
The historian David Nuremberg argues that anti-Judaism, anti-Judaism, constitutes the very foundation of Western civilization. In one era after another, he demonstrates that the Christian West defined itself in opposition to its fantasized negative image of Judaism and Jews. The historian Shulamit Volkov famously argued that anti-Semitism functioned as a cultural code in pre-1933 Germany, just as, for example, being pro or anti-Dreyfus in turn of the century France was an identity signaling attitudes toward the church, secular society, democracy, and more. Similar to people who are pro-Trump, anti-Trump, like the name Monica. What does, it, what does it tell you? It tells you not only about your politics, but about your views on culture and society, your friends, where you fit in. Jews are blamed for capitalism, and Jews are blamed for communism. In all of this, Jews serve as points of unification for disparate political groups. So the Nazis blame both Soviets and the Americans as being under the control of Jews. One thinks of Viktor Orban. How did he elect, get elected in Hungary? He got elected as a big surprise. There was no reason to elect a far right wing leader at that point. And then two political advisors from the United States who happened to be Jewish came in and said to him, if you lambaste George Soros, a Jewish financier who had funded the Central European University and who is a liberal and a Democrat, you blame him and you'll whip up a frenzy in Hungary and get elected and that's exactly what happened. And the Central University, uh, European University had to move in fact to Vienna out of Budapest. Zionist thinkers already in the 19th century, responding to the pogroms in Russia in the 1880s, threw up their hands and they said anti-Semitism is a disease and it's an incurable disease. The only thing to do is for Jews to get out of Europe and return to their ancestral homeland, Israel. Now, resentment is often the key to switching from words to acts of violence. I want to turn as an example to what happened in Algeria. Algeria was colonized by the French. In 1870, the French decided to grant French citizenship to the 35,000 Jews living in Algeria. Very nice for them, but of course, as you can imagine, the Muslims of Algeria were terribly resentful, and the consequences were drastic and awful politically. To what extent did those attitudes of resentment then come with Muslims and Jews into Europe itself. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to point out that scholars from Hannah Arendt to Aimé Césaire to W.B. Du Bois to Franz Fanon have concluded that European, the European racism practiced in Africa contributed to antisemitism's exterminist turn on the continent. How does this work? Germany colonized Southwest Africa. It went in there and it set up concentration camps and it committed genocide. It brought with them the anti-Semitism of Europe and transferred it to racism toward Africans. The methods developed of concentration camps and genocide in Africa were then brought back to Europe and functioned against Jews during the Holocaust. The anthropologist Mati Bunzel has pointed to a distinction. He says that according to anti-Semites, Jews are not viewed as part of the nation of France or of Germany. Whereas those who hate Muslims, Islamophobics, say that Muslims are not part of civilization. And in that sense, Muslims are also aligned with Africa because as Ashil Mbembe has pointed out, Africa, in European imagination, stands out as the supreme receptacle of the West's obsession with absence, with lack, with non-being. And that Africanness and Muslimness get associated together in Islamophobia. What is clear is that they go together. When Islamophobia surges, so does anti-Semitism. At the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the shooter went into the synagogue to kill Jews because they were helping Muslim immigrants. Now, the 
Environmental degradation that we are now experiencing worldwide that is ongoing has also created a new situation and a serious problem that affects all forms of anti-Semitism and racism. The Global Wealth Report of Credit Suisse estimates that the lower half of the global population possesses barely 1% of global wealth, half the world, 1% while the richest 10% of adults own 80% of all wealth. How does this translate? Today, anti-Semites claim that Jews are the winners. They're part of the richest 10%, while Islamophobics claim that Muslims are a threat because they are part of the losers. In other words, Jews are the magnum capitalists stealing all the wealth, whereas Muslims have nothing, and therefore they are the danger, the hordes of immigrants flowing into Europe trying to rob the wealth of the middle classes. At the same time, we do have the phenomenon of Muslim attacks against Jews, especially in Europe, but spreading worldwide. So Muslims, Muslim attackers have admitted to hunting Jews to murder them. We see this at the Jewish school in Toulouse, France, the Chabad house in Mumbai, India, the synagogues in Oslo, Stockholm, Copenhagen, Vienna, Tunisia, Istanbul, and elsewhere with attacks by Muslims with guns killing people. There's the Jewish Museum in Brussels, the kosher supermarket in Paris, two elderly Jewish women who lived alone in Paris attacked, tortured, and killed a 23-year-old Jewish man kidnapped, tortured, and killed by a Muslim gang in Paris. There have been attacks as well at Christmas markets in Berlin and Strasbourg, on the boardwalk in Nice, the Bataclan Theater in Paris. These are general assaults on European society and on those who have won, including Jews, in their eyes. Muslim attacks on Jews also lead Jews to reconsider their politics and this is also an important thing. We are living in the midst of a political reorientation. The designations of left or right don't quite make sense anymore, certainly not as seen from the lens of racism and anti-Semitism. Far right-wing political parties now see an advantage to dropping their anti-Semitism and emphasizing instead Islamophobia as a way, they hope, to attract Jewish voters and Jewish support Far left-wing parties that downplay the significance of anti-Semitism and give vocal support and sympathy to Muslims more than to Jews and throwing in attacks on Israel for good measure have lost Jewish votes and supporters. So the political question for Jews now is where to go politically, where to belong. We see in this country the rise of Republican use of ugly anti-Semitic stereotypes in North Carolina, in California, in Connecticut. Republicans who accuse Democrats of being crazed by money and political posters, for example, of uh, the Democratic state representative Matthew Lesser in Connecticut with a kind of crazed look in his eyes holding big wads of cash. It's an extension of this American phenomenon that has been applied in the past to Asian Americans, and you may remember the Willie Horton ads used by George H.W. Bush in his 1988 campaign. But at the same time comes the Jewish response, which is equally problematic. I wanted to say quickly something about the role played by the State of Israel and its current government. First of all, let me say something about the BDS movement, that is, boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. It's a complex and a little bit slippery movement that, on the one hand, says it wants to end Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, lands occupied after the 1967 war. And on the other hand, factions that say no BDS is about ending the state of Israel altogether. There are elements in the BDS movement that make political sense and other elements that make use of ugly anti-Semitic stereotypes. 
Comparing Israel to Nazi Germany really doesn't help. It is a way to rally rage and anger, dissension that ultimately backfires politically. The BDS movement, on one hand, is nonviolent. On the other hand, by using comparisons of Israel with Hitler, it isn't peaceful. It is, in fact, in that sense, anti-Semitic and not nonviolent. At the same time, the government of the State of Israel is very similar to governments around the world, far right wing, including of this country. And it's no surprise that the Prime Minister of Israel and Trump are such good friends. The politics in the State of Israel are further complicated when the Prime Minister makes use of anti-Semitic stereotypes himself. So recently, Trump, in exchange for Jewish money and support, and 20% of the Jewish community in America voted for Trump, Trump moved the US Embassy to Jerusalem. Instead of bringing rabbis to make some prayers at this dedication ceremony, two Christian ministers were brought from the United States. Robert Jeffress, who once said that Jews are going to hell, and John Hagee, who once suggested that Hitler was sent by God. Why would these two men be invited to say a blessing in Israel, in Jerusalem, to dedicate a US embassy? This shows you something about the ways in which politics have overtaken Jewish principles, and also the ways in which Jewish leaders, and let's keep this in mind, do not represent the Jewish people, let alone Judaism itself. Finally, I want to just conclude with a word about the internet. As we know, the internet has become a place where anti-Semites and racists can rage and rage and spew hatred as if there is simply id and no superego. The internet is in that way an anti-modern place. It's not a modern piece of technology. It's a place with no public square. It's a place where ideas are not subjected to reason, to analysis, to judgment, or to show evidence. The internet speaks as a voice without a person, or a person perhaps completely wrapped up like a mummy. There is no identity. Further, there is no subjectivity. There is no face of the other that the philosopher Manuel Levinas told us was a guarantee for ethical behavior. We have in this country a president who dog whistles and the KKK jumps up into action. Neo-Nazis are not condemned. We have voices that lack, utterly lack dignity and compassion. Charlottesville, Pittsburgh. But even more than that, I am afraid of the armed militias that have formed in states in this country. I was recently told there are 33 armed militias in Georgia with automatic weapons that practice once a month, 17 of them in South Carolina. How many more elsewhere in this country? What do we do? What do we do? We gather together. We speak to one another face to face. We argue. We listen. We try very hard to overcome resentment. Resentment is such a dangerous force politically. We try also to get over identity politics. I can be understood, I'm sure, even by those who are not women, not Jews, certainly not professors. We can understand one another, and we must. And finally, how important it is, a meeting like this, to forge alliances, to talk, to listen, and to come together, and hopefully, what we are experiencing right now will not last, but change. Thank you.